Um, you're in for a treat. Listening to Dr. Furman is going to be amazing. He will inspire you. He will share you. He's like an encyclopedia. He knows stuff. He remembers, every, he remembers so much. You will listen, you will learn, and you'll be ready to start tomorrow. Dr. Furman is a board-certified family physician, six-time New York Times bestseller, author, and internationally recognized expert on nutrition and natural healing. Dr. Furman has authored numerous research articles, published in medical journals, and is on the faculty of the Northern, Northern Arizona University Health Science Division. He serves as president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. In his hundreds of radio and television appearances, including The Dr. Oz Show, The Today Show, and Good Morning America, Dr. Furman has educated millions of people on the long-range benefits of eating healthy. His four hugely successful PBS specials, which have raised over $30 million for public television, bring essential nutritional knowledge to homes all across America. He will be signing and selling his new books in the hallway after the meeting. Let me just take a look and make sure. Oh, there's, there's some more angels I forgot to mention, and they're the people at the Waller Wellness Center. One of them is here tonight. They take good care of people. They help make you healthy. I was in the right seat on May 4, 2016. You're in the right seat now, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Joel Furman. Hello. Oh, I'm loud, and I'm on. Good to see all you guys. I'm excited to talk to you today. It's really great. I was here, I don't know, a year and a half ago or a year ago. I just love being here and love speaking to you. And, and it's just so personally satisfying to see so many health transformations of people who've lost 50 pounds, 100 pounds, reversed their diabetes without diabetes anymore, who've recovered from heart disease, recovered from asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis. So I'm starting out by giving you the clear message that the, the advances in nutritional science are 100 times more powerful than, than drugs that you get from your physicians. They don't have the ability to reverse psoriatic arthritis and keep you off the medications that are chemotherapeutic agents that cause cancer. In other words, to help your lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, you have to give a person a, a chemotherapeutic agent that causes cancer, and it's only partially effective. What I'm saying to you is that nutritional, these advances in nutritional science enable us to have a healthier and a happier life than has ever before been possible in human history. We can live longer and better than ever before. And I'm giving you information tonight that is gonna give you superpowers. Let me explain. Because I'm saying that heart disease never has to occur. We can, win, we ne we can wipe out all heart attacks. Strokes don't have to occur. How many people here want to take a pledge to make sure they never get demented when they get older? What's good is living a long time if you're demented, right? Doesn't have to be. You can do the right things right now to never have it happen to you. The science has advanced to the point we can wipe out dementia, we can wipe out strokes, we can live longer with great health in our later years, right? All this is possible. And if you're suffering with an illness like high blood pressure, like diabetes, like an autoimmune condition, including asthma and migraines and joint pains. You can get, make a total recovery and get your life back, like so many thousands have already. Now, I know it seems exciting to have superpowers like Superman, to be able to fly through the air or emit rays of light through your eyeballs to melt metal, but we're not being invaded by aliens from another world. We don't need those type of superpowers. They don't do any good because there's no people with, those, with superpowers attacking us. What's attacking us are people with, with serious diseases getting demented, getting depressed, getting seriously ill. And I'm giving you superpowers where you can put on those powers on yourself, get and be an example of healthy living, restore your health to normal, know the knowledge where you have the ability to heal and help other people. Don't you want that superpower? Where you can take care of your loved ones, your friends, your community, so they don't have to be sick anymore, so your neighbor with high blood pressure, you could say, you know what? Maybe your doctor didn't tell you that blood pressure medications cause cancer, that the studies show that after 10 years of use, women taking calcium channel blockers have double the risk of breast cancer. Your doctor didn't tell you that. 
And he didn't tell you you can be off those drugs within three months of eating properly and not get cancer. And we can wipe out cancer across America. We have populations across the world that have 150th the amount of cancer, breast cancer. Why can't we duplicate? And years ago, these cancers didn't exist. We have the knowledge to wipe out cancer right now. And it's not going to be this magic pill. You're not going to smoke cigarettes, three packs a day for 30 years, and we're going to invent this magic pill you're going to take that's going to take away your risk of lung cancer. Can't happen. You can't eat the American diet, a breast cancer-causing diet, and expect to discover this magic pill you can take and not get breast cancer. If you eat the diet other Americans eat, you can get the diseases other Americans get. So the real superpowers that are real valuable are the tremendous satisfaction and reward you have to take care of your own life. You know how they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first? Be a radiant, an example of radiant, superior health. And then go out and do good with your full mental faculties, with your brain fueled by high nutrient foods, so you have your full creativity and intelligence at, at, on display, and do good in this world. That's the real superpowers that are available to people. And that's what's so great about having all these people in Detroit and so much opportunity here in Detroit for people actually teaching this message and being, having the camaraderie and togetherness and humanity of people with good purposes getting together to help other people. This is what life's all about. And that type of humanity and working together is so good for your health and longevity besides eating right. Did you follow that? So the underlying theme of this presentation, which I'm going to get started in this presentation in about two minutes, we're going to get started. But the theme of this presentation is that heart attacks are not natural. High blood pressure is not natural. It's not the inevitable consequence of aging. It's not genetic. It's demonstrative of eating a diet style that doesn't fit our genes. It's not compatible with human species and human life, the fact that we're all getting cancer. The fact that all these people get cancer and you're taught this nonsense that because everybody is sick, it's okay to be sick and it's natural to be sick and it's genetic or it's just from aging and we just go to doctors and we expect doctors to be our savior and the drugs are going to save us. And in most cases, the vast majority of cases, the drugs just give us permission to keep eating the same diet we're on to begin with. It's like going to the, taking the car to the gas station mechanic with the oil light flashing on your dashboard, and he snaps the wire to the dashboard so you can't see the oil lights flashing, and you just go ahead driving the car with no oil. You go to the doctor, he gives you a medication, and because your blood pressure now looks okay, you think you're okay. You're not okay. You're worse off now. Because your blood, the atherosclerosis and the hardening of the arteries, the inflammation in the blood vessel wall, the fat built up on the inside and the outside of the blood vessels, are going to continue to occur maybe even at a faster rate. Because the statin drugs make you gain weight, make you more diabetic, make your, make your inflammation. You know, there, there's all types of damage from these medications that are not talked about. People don't have informed consent. They're, the side effects of medications are completely hidden from people. If they knew about them and knew how the, especially when you use them in conjunction with other medications, if people really knew the dangers, I bet millions of more people would, try, would more embrace nutritional excellence as a primary therapeutic modality. So I want you guys to stop, to start right now today, I want to see you take care of yourself so you achieve incredible health. So you totally disease-proof your body. You are gonna do it? Yeah. Let's do it together, right? We gotta do it. All right, you ready to get started with the lecture then? Yeah. All right, let's get started. All right, we're going through some basics here because food has nutrients in it. Food gives us macronutrients. The word macro means big. And macronutrients contain calories, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And here's the thing you have to remember. And I am going to quiz you on this. I'm not kidding on that. You have to, I'm teaching you this so you can articulate it to other people. That's why you're here. If you're going to learn it well, and you're going to apply it to your own life, you have to be able to explain it. The more calories you eat in life, the shorter your life. Do I have to say that again? The only thing ever been proven in the history of science to radically 
increase the lifespan of all species of animals, including primates, and we're primates, is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient adequacy. I'll say that again. Only one thing extends human lifespan dramatically, and that's eating less calories, assuming all the micronutrient needs are met. So that means you have to eat less fat, less carbohydrate, and less protein to live longer. And the more you eat those foods, the faster you die. Food also gives us micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Yet most Americans, I should say all Americans, are ubiquitously deficient in micronutrients because they're eating foods that just contain calories, macronutrients, with no significant micronutrient load. Your health is determined by how many foods you have, eat that have a high micronutrient load with a high micronutrient per calorie density. You want to eat foods that give you lots of micronutrients but, let, but are naturally lower in calories. That's the secret to living longer and preventing all diseases. All right, you got that? Okay, we can go home. <laughs> it's true, we can go home right now, you got it. Here, so the formula, the first principle of a nutritarian diet, it means that your health, your healthy life expectancy, how long you're gonna live and the quality of your life in your later years, is proportional to the nutrient per calorie density of the diet you eat all through life. You eat a diet with a high nutrient density, you live long and you age or slowly, and you live to be 100 years old without developing dementia. Whereas if you do the opposite and eat lots of high calorie, low nutrient foods, then the body ages rapidly and the brain cells are lost as you get older and your brain becomes a mush of jello. So, give me an example of some foods that are rich in calories but low in micronutrients. Sugar, french fries, pizza, eggs, that's right. Is that most of the foods that Americans eat don't contain micronutrient, many micronutrients, especially the antioxidants and phytochemicals that prevent cancer, because those are mostly in colorful plant foods. So the American diet consists of more than 50% of processed foods, like pasta, and bread, and salad oils, and donuts, and cookies, and crackers, and rice cakes, and breakfast bars, and chips, and soft drinks, and baked breakfast cereals, and am I going too quickly? <laughs> Candy, soda, bars, chips, donuts, croissants, whatever. It's what Americans are eating. In certain parts of the country, they're eating 75 to 90 percent of processed foods. This is fast food. Right? This is food with no nutrients in it. And then we eat 30, about a third of our calories from animal products. And animal products do not contain a major micronutrient load. They're a rich source of calories, they're high in protein and fat, but they don't contain phytochemicals and antioxidants. And the 10% of produce we eat is really not 10%, it's closer to 5% because they consider pot white potato and french fries as part of that 10% and ketchup as part of that 10%, about 5%, doesn't meet the human's need for phytochemicals. The brain needs a continual supply of antioxidants and phytochemicals to prevent aging and destruction of brain cells. We don't get that on an American diet. All Americans lose brain cells rapidly in their age, they lose memory, they lose intelligence. You can't have an intelligent American over the age of 80 if they're eating like other Americans. And you know how many Americans are overweight? Like all of them. Because authorities will tell you, scientific authorities and health officials will tell you that was that 66% of Americans were overweight, and now lately it's been 70%, but those figures are totally wrong. Because they base those figures based on a BMI of above 25 being classified as being overweight. And all long-lived societies, all blue zones, all areas of the world where people live around 100 years old or where we have centenarians, always have BMIs below 23. Never, you never have long life in a BMI of 24 or 25. So if we use a, a realistic, healthy BMI of 23 as the demarcation line, then we classify about 88% of Americans as being overweight. But the 12% now are at a normal weight. The majority of those people 
are depressed, alcoholics, drug addicts, occult cancers, autoimmune conditions, digestive disorders, smokers, you know, 15% of Americans smoke. So the reasons that, so most people that are a normal weight are even more, are even sicker than the people who are overweight. It's only about 2% of Americans eat a healthy diet. Only 2.7% actually claim to eat healthy and, and exercise in America. So, so, so you were looking at a, popula a ske skewed population of sickly people. This diet, this mixture of high animal products and high processed foods is really the witch's brew to develop the formula to get a high rates of cancer. Fast food is particularly designed to addict you to want to eat more calories because it's rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream. That's why it's called fast food. You can access it fast, you can purchase it quickly, you can open the bag or the boxer and you can eat it quickly. It gets broken down and digested and absorbed into the bloodstream quickly too. It's full of salt and sugar, it contains synthetic ingredients and chemicals and toxins. You know, it's things that Americans are eating that makes it even worse. There are parts of the country where you can't even find produce called food deserts where people are eating 90% of their food intake from fast, fast food. Right, nutritionally barren, empty calorie foods. So let me go back for a minute just to check that you're getting this. Let me stop here for a second. Because let's say I just ate 50 calories a day too much over my metabolic needs. Just 50 calories a day too much. One extra bite of a cookie. Is that so bad? A little bit extra calories? Well, yeah. 50 calories a day too much over a year times 365, that's, you know, three pounds a year for 10 years, that's 30 pounds. 30 pounds is 20 years of life lost over your ideal weight. What if I ate 50 calories a day too little oh, um, compared to my metabolic needs? Then what's going to happen to me? Am I going to shrink? Am I going to become anorexic? Become too thin? Lose muscle mass and bone mass? Look like an Auschwitz victim? What's going to happen to me? What do you think? What? Nothing. 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 You won't lose any weight. You're, what will happen is your body will adjust. It'll, once it reaches its ideal weight and your body fat is low enough, your body will maintain that perfect size for your long-term health. And as you cut back on calories a little below your metabolic needs, your body will slow down its metabolic, weight, metabolic rate by lowering the body temperature, by lowering the respiratory quotient, the amount of calories lost with breathing, by lowering the thyroid a little bit. It'll do everything in its power to slow the, meta, the rate at which you're aging. So now, the fact that you're aging slower, your muscles and your bones will stay more dense as you age. You'll actually have stronger, more youthful, and vigorous tissues that are less likely to develop osteoporosis and sarcopenia, weakening the muscles and bones with aging, because you under ate calories a little bit. You maintained your youthful vigor. You didn't get lose weight. You stayed there. You see, I'm saying this up front because most Americans are thinking they got to look for some fat or gimmick to speed up the metabolic rate so they can eat more food and not get fat. No, you have to slow down your metabolic rate so you can eat less food and not get too thin. Do you understand the difference? Because when you have fat on your body, the fat cells on your body are like a cancer-producing machine. Fat cells make your body insulin resistant. So your pancreas now has to work harder to make more insulin. Insulin is the primary fat storage hormone. It, make, it stores fat by causing cellular replication and cellular growth. It's a growth-promoting hormone. When you're fully grown and you have high levels of insulin circulating, those growth hormones promote cancer. And they're pro-angiogenesis. Do you know what the word angiogenesis means? Who knows what the word angiogenesis means? No, it's not the second book of the Bible. That's not it. <laughs> What's that? No, angio means blood and genesis means to make. It means to make new blood vessels. So what happens is that insulin makes 
blood vessels grow to fuel the fat cells because the fat demands glucose and, and nourishment. They need oxygen to grow. Fat cells need to be sustained by oxygen and blood. And, and so the insulin makes fat cells grow and helps fat cells stay alive. And cancers work the same way. Fat cells secrete angiogenesis promoters themselves to, to call blood vessels to grow into them to make themselves be fueled. Right? So insulin promotes cancer as it promotes fat growth, and fat cells promote cancer because they're angiogenesis promoters. But when you eat foods like green vegetables and beans and mushrooms and onions, these have anti-angiogenesis phytochemicals in them. Mushrooms are the most powerful anti-angiogenic food. Beans and soybeans and Green cruciferous vegetables are anti-angiogenic, meaning they say, no way, Jose. I'm not letting you put fat on your body. They say, no way, Jose. I'm not letting angiogenesis occur. I'm not letting cancer cells just replicate and get their oxygenation and the nourishment they needs. I'm not going to let that happen to you. And they're bilingual. They say it in Spanish. No way, Jose. They say it like that. So it's not enough for a diet to be calorically favorable and micronutrient favorable. It also has to be hormonally favorable. By hormonally favorable, it means it can't be highly glycemic. So you can't put a lot of sugar into your bloodstream that's going to promote too much insulin. Now I eat this mango, and there's some sugar goes into my bloodstream with the mango, right? But it goes in slowly because there's fiber and nutrients that slow it down. But if I'm 10 pounds heavier, my body might have to produce five times as much insulin for that mango. If I'm 20 pounds heavier or 30 pounds heavier, if I'm 50 pounds heavier over my ideal weight, my beta cells in my pancreas may have to produce 10 times as much insulin compared to what I needed for that mango if I was 50 pounds lighter. Did you follow what I'm saying right now? After all these years of putting on weight and my pancreas beta cells having to work so hard, they poop out and they can't produce enough insulin. They can't produce all that insulin to keep my sugars controlled so my sugar starts, may start to rise and it may get the signs of diabetes, but the damage didn't start to occur when I got diagnosed with diabetes. The damage to the body was already occurring 10, 20 years before I even got a diagnosis of diabetes when the insulin was starting to be higher. So what do doctors do? for your diabetes, for your high blood sugar, they give you more insulin to accelerate, to make you gain weight more. Or they give you drugs that make the failing beta cells in the pancreas work harder to produce even, to keep up with the, on, with the production of insulin, which accelerates their death, which shortens your lifespan even further. The Accord study was stopped because they showed that the people with diabetes who were set up to have more medical care, more doctor visits, more visits with the nurse practitioners and the diabetologists to get their sugars better controlled, more medications, were getting more severe side effects, more morbidity and more mortality and dying off. Where those who weren't going to doctors with more out of control diabetes were living longer. They stopped the study. Does that show that, the, that it's better to let your sugars be out of control? Of course not. It's better not to have diabetes. It's just the drugs are not the answer. It's not better to have a higher blood sugar, it's better to have a lower blood sugar, but pushing it down with drugs don't solve the problem, it complicates the issue. Because the drugs make you gain weight, make you become more diabetic, and make the failing beta cells have to work harder anyway. It's a nutritionally created disease, you can't solve it with a drug, and the drugs give people permission slip to keep eating the same diet that caused the problem to begin with, and the drugs give you more appetite and make you want to eat more. Mostly what doctors do, even though physicians are great in emergency situations, mostly, the mostly what doctors do is treat chronic dietary-induced diseases with medications. It's mostly what they do. And so what they do is not really worthless, because worthless is not a strong enough word, because what they do is worse than worthless. Did you follow that one? It's actually mostly harmful. Harmful is worse than worthless. Worthless is not accurate. The only way you can achieve good health is by you taking charge of your health destiny, of you controlling your own health. You can't expect to buy health in a pill or a bottle, have it given to you with medical care. It's not access to medical care that's the problem. It's access to produce that's the problem. It's access to information that's the problem. 
It's being brainwashed with wrong information that's killing people and creating human, tremendous human tragedy. And people eating this junk food that causes death. So here's the word glycemic load. It means not the amount of glucose that enters the bloodstream from the food. It has to do with how fast the glucose enters the bloodstream from that food. Because when the sugar enters the bloodstream very fast, and a lot enters in that first hour, the high glucose excursion in the bloodstream damages brain cells. So every time you have that donut, every time you have that ice cream, you're causing brain cell damage. And if you feed it to your children, they're losing their intelligence and their creativity. You're dummying them down. And that candy consumption in childhood is not only linked to lower intelligence, but it's also linked to adult violence, criminal behavior, drug abuse, and drug addiction. Did you get that? One-fifth of Americans are mentally ill. One-fifth. As if it's some kind of luck involved, or your bad situation in life. The link between, and, and the studies show that two servings of commercial baked goods or fast food a week doubles the risk of depression. We have children committing suicide. Last week, a girl committed suicide in the high school bathroom. Fast food and junk food and candy causes brain damage and causes s severe depression and mental illness and causes people to take their own life. When the food enters the bloodstream, when the glucose enters the bloodstream so rapidly, it not only damages brain cells, it also stimulates dopamine in the brain, which is the same addictive stimulation that you get when you take opiates or cocaine. It becomes brain, it stimulates the brain, and over time the brain becomes dopamine insensitive. So you desire more stimulation, and your life, you live for that stimulation. You live for getting done with work. So you can go home and drink alcohol or go eat or pig out, go to restaurants and buffets and have ice cream and fast food and fried foods or to snort cocaine or to smoke cigarettes or to drink alcohol or to party. Your whole your pleasure in life comes from pigging out or st trying to stimulate your dop get dopamine stimulation in the brain. It starts with Halloween and birthday parties and kids hiding their candy in their their dresser drawers or their night table or under their bed and sneaking candy. They start to de de destroy their brain function. You're no longer losing your creativity, losing your intelligence. Once you're an addict, the addictive drives drive your decision making in life. So you're no longer in control of the bank. You lost the keys to the safe. Because you're not in control, the primitive brain wanting its addictive satisfaction drives you. It's like a little baby, Wah, I want my bottle. You're just living for that addictive stimulation because these foods that are absorbing the bloodstream rapidly take over the brain. I know all these people that say, oh yeah, I'm smoking cigarettes, oh, I have too much stress in my life, or my wife smacked up the car, my son flunked his exam, or my husband lost his job, blah, 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 blah. It's not the right time to quit. As if the addiction, you know, first of all, it's not the, of course it's not the right time to quit. It wasn't the right time to quit today or yesterday. It was, a quit, it was time to quit it was two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. They always had some excuse why it wasn't never the time to quit, right? And they're not, the, the addiction doesn't make your stress better. It derails your ability to deal intelligently with stresses, to solve them, to be creative, to perform better at your job and your career, to be loving and thoughtful to your family. It makes you more angry. It even makes you more violent. It makes you have a little more... You know, um, lose your temper more. The addiction takes away your ability and is the major cause of your stress in life. These people who are overweight and say, I can't lose weight now. I don't want to eat healthy now. I'm going to wait because I'm too much stress right now. That's their addiction talking. That's how addicts talk. And the more junk food you eat, the more you're an addict. The harder it is to make the dietary change, the more you're an addict and the more toxins and junk food you eat, the more difficult it is. But you have to start to flood the body with nutrients to get rid of this addiction, addictive type thinking. When's the time to make the change? It's past. If you haven't done it by now, today's the day. That means if you smoke cigarettes, today's the day to stop. Stop fooling yourself. If you're eating fast food and junk food and french fries and pizza 
and candy and cake and white flour and pasta. Now's the time to stop. Today. This is it. It's not the right time a week from now. That may save your life. Starting right today. You're still alive, I assume, if you're here. So we're talking about fast food like oil and sugar, because oil's a fast food. If you have walnut oil, olive oil, avocado oil, any kind of oil, there's no fiber or nutrients associated with it. It's extracted out of the food. So it rushes into the bloodstream very rapidly and signals dopamine in the brain because 100 calories enter the bloodstream all at once. Within three to five minutes, those 120 calories enter the bloodstream. If I had white flour, a piece of chocolate cake, those 200 calories of sugar would enter the bloodstream within five minutes. That's 50 calories a minute or 40 calories a minute into the bloodstream. If I had 200 calories of beans, those 200 calories of carbohydrate would enter the bloodstream over a four hour period. That's one calorie a minute. You don't need much insulin to deal with one calorie a minute compared to 40 to 50 calories a minute. Are you following me? If you guys had that oil entering the bloodstream, a tablespoon of olive oil, that's 120 calories entering in over two or three minutes. That's 30, 40 calories a minute into the bloodstream. If you had the whole nut, like the walnut or the pecan or the sesame seed or the pistachio nut, those fats are entering the bloodstream over a three to four hour period. That's one calorie a minute, not 30 or 40 calories a minute. Completely different biological effects. Plus, when you eat nuts and seeds, the fibers, the sterols and stanols bind fat. So the fibers pass out into the toilet bowl, they carry fat with it, and you have more stool fat, and all the calories, fat calories, aren't biologically accessible to the body. Also, the fat, there's such powerful fat mag magnets that they have extra affinity for, L for oxidized LDL. So the worst type of cholesterol, the type of cholesterol that causes irregular heartbeats and causes heart attacks, are sucked out preferentially into the toilet over the fats that were in supplied by the nuts and seeds. So the fat goes in both directions. It flows through the small intestinal wall into the bloodstream, from the bloodstream back to the small intestines, and these fat magnets are able to grab to some fat, allowing other fats to come into the body, and it sucks out the most dangerous, most unhealthy fats and puts them into the toilet. So if we had a buffet right here in the front of the room, I'm setting up this buffet. We're all going to serve you food right after this lecture. And here's what we're going to do. The people on the left side of the room, on this side of the room, are going to have, as they're waiting in line to get their food, I'm going to give all of them an apple to eat, a 65-calorie apple. And because they're chewing the apple as they're waiting in line, and it makes them feel full with the water content and the fiber and the nutrients, they will generally take 65 calories less on the buffet because they had the 65 calories from the apple. But on this side of the room over here, the people, instead of getting the, the apple, are going to get a tablespoon of olive oil, which is 120 calories. But because the oil has no fiber and essentially no nutrients, there's no phytochemicals to fuel the growth of bacteria. There's no space that spans in your stomach. You're not going to sense those calories at all. Oil does not shut down the apostat at all. So now you go up to the line to get your buffet, you're going to eat the same amount of calories whether you had the oil or not. So you're going to consume 120 calories extra. Now the average American is consuming 300 to 400 calories extra a day. I'm telling you the goal is to consume 50 calories less a day, not 300 calories more a day. And the only way you're going to be satisfied with eating 50 calories less is if you have plenty of bulk and fiber in your diet that makes you feel full because the nutrients and the fibers keep that brain, control the apostat, keep that brain satisfied. And when you eat those four foods you're supposed to be eating all the time, the two cooked foods and the two raw foods, these foods fuel the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut that thicken the biofilm like a protective barrier, slowing the absorption of glucose through the walls of the villi. So now any food you eat is low glycemic practically. What are those four foods? the two raw foods and two cooked foods I'm talking about. Well, the two raw foods that fuel the growth of these healthy bacteria that slow the absorption of glucose even further are raw green vegetables, like salad vegetables, and raw onion or raw scallion. Those have particularly powerful effects to build up beneficial bacteria, to thicken the biofilm, 
on the digestive tract wall, and the two cooked foods that help thicken the biofilm and create that anti-diabetic effect are beans and mushrooms cooked. Mushrooms have a mild carcinogen called agaritine, which is blown off with a little bit of cooking. But when you eat greens and scallion or onion, and you eat mushrooms or beans too, now you have the perfect formula to feel satisfied with less calories. And now when you have that oatmeal for morning or that mango, the glycemic effect of the mango is, is, is very low because the thickened bacterial biofilm from eating the greens and the beans and the mushrooms have made the glycemic effect of the mango much lower. Did you follow that? Your body is a miraculous self-healing machine designed to be at its perfect weight and its perfect health and its perfect strength and its full mental faculties for 100 years if it's fed properly. Disease is not predominantly genetic. It looks like it's genetic because we have all have inherited genetic weaknesses, but they only have a chance to be expressed if we eat the American diet, if we eat the wrong foods. Matter of fact, being overweight is not a genetic weakness. It's a genetic strength. Did you understand? You know why? Well, look, for the 50,000 years humans were on this planet, most people died because they couldn't get enough food to eat. They had to survive on a little bit of food. People with the slowest metabolic rates, who could get by on very little food, survived. People who required more calories died off. People who can get by on very little food have very slow metabolic rates. They're going to age very slowly. Those are the people more likely to live past 100 years if they're fed the right food and they keep their normal weight. But thrust into American society, this person who has a very slow metabolic rate, eating the high calorie, high fiber, high glycemic, high oiled American diet, is going to, with their slower metabolic rate, with their healthier body, who can survive a famine or survive an earthquake or they'll survive the winter with no food, their body has the ability to live longer and has survived. Their genetic makeup has survived to be here in today's society, and they're the healthiest people in the world with the least chance of getting cancer and the least chance of, and, but, but thrust in the American scenario, scenario of food scenario, they're at the highest risk now. Put them back on the earth 30,000 years ago, and they'd be the, they'd be the most, ones the most likely to survive. It's not, a, it's not a genetic defect. It's a genetic advantage. And if they eat properly, they, can, they should live to be 100 years old or more. But they have to live within the genetic confines and the genetic um, ability of their own bodies. And they have to eat the amount of food they require to maintain a favorable weight. You can't do that on the American diet. Because when you eat these foods that are so addictive, it drives you into overeating behavior, which I'm talking about now. So these foods are slow. We're talking about beans and nuts compared to oil, right? And the fast foods stimulate the brain. These fast foods that you buy in a fast food restaurant also contain carcinogenic substances. And when you barbecue and you fry or you grill, you know, you prepare meats at high temperature, they form nitrosamino compounds and heterocyclic amines and hydrocarbons that are powerfully cancerous. And the World Health Organization has classified processed meats and red meats as a class one carcinogen. Class one means they're not probable carcinogens, it means they're definite carcinogens. These are well established to be carcinogens. And these toxins build up in our tissues. We build up the glucose the high excursions of glucose from eating high glycemic carbohydrates stick to your tissues. You know how the diabetics get blind? They get nerve damage in their feet. They develop kidney failure. It's because the buildup of those AJEs, they get glycoproteins formation. You build up glucose moieties attached to proteins on the body. In other words, you build it. These advanced glycation end products are toxic, and they build up on your tissues, and they destroy people who are diabetic, but they also destroy all of us who are not diabetic as well. AGEs cause us to age faster when we eat foods with high glycemic carbohydrates like white rice and white bread and white sugar and all these things people are consuming. These high glycemic carbohydrates. So these foods have a powerful link to cancer. I always say the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? 
You guys know when you buy a french fry in a fast food restaurant, that french fry has been heated in oil that's been heating for hours, for forming aldehydes and other carcinogenic compounds. And people say, you know, so french fries are incredibly powerful cancer-causing agents. People say it's not that bad, you just have fast food in moderation. Can't be that bad to have one serving of french fries a week. Well, what does one serving of french fries a week happen? 25% increased risk of breast cancer or prostate cancer from one serving of french fries per week. Just one serving of fries. And they show that even people who don't eat the french fries, just working in a food fast food restaurant, just breathing in the smoke from the fryers, just working in a movie theater, breathing in the smoke from the popcorn machines where they have that artificial fake chemical butter, increases your risk of cancer. Just being a, just inhaling it increases your risk of cancer. That's how toxic it is. It's teratogenic. It causes birth defects, too. These are really dangerous foods, right? And they damage the brain. You see it says on the top of that slide, two servings a week of fast food or commercial baked goods double the risk of developing depression. We're talking here, obviously, about croissants and donuts and cookies, right? And burgers and pizzas. Remember I told you about 15 minutes ago? I said a diet, it's not good enough for your diet to be, to have the right micronutrient density, to be rich in nutrients. It's not enough. It also has to be hormonally favorable. What I was saying to you earlier is a piece of chicken is like a bagel, right? I was telling you that a piece of chicken is like a bagel. Why? Why is a piece of chicken like a bagel? Right, they're both, rich sources, they're both rich sources of calories and macronutrients, but neither one has a significant micronutrient load. They don't contain the phytochemicals and antioxidants to prevent cancer. They're just a source of macronutrients with no micronutrients. Your health is determined by your micronutrient content of your diet. And the more macronutrients you consume, the shorter your life. The more chicken sandwiches and cheese sandwiches and burgers and pizza you consume, the shorter your life. But it's worse than that. The chicken is also like the bagel because, the ba because they both are hormonally unfavorable. The bagel promotes the, into the, up, the excessive amount of insulin. And the chicken, because it's a high protein animal product, promotes excessive production of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. It's called insulin-like growth factor one because it binds to the insulin receptor. It, affects, it promotes angiogenesis and growth like insulin does. It's a primary growth hormone that might be useful when the baby is growing or when the cow is growing rapidly, but for us adults who aren't growing anymore, excessive amounts of growth hormone promotes cancer, promotes aging of the brain, and promotes early death, and accelerates your aging, graying of the hair and losing of your eyesight and weakening of your bones and deter deterioration of your muscles. It's, it's damaging to have higher levels of these, excessively high levels of these hormones. What I'm saying to you right now is that when you're eating animal protein, we learned in grade school that it was biologically complete. That's what we thought made it good. Now we know that's what made it bad because when the proteins are biologically complete, your body is getting too much biologically complete protein rushing all at once into the bloodstream, creating an excessive amount of production of IGF-1 just like the excess sugar rushed into the bloodstream with the bagel or the pizza dough. When you get your, most of your protein from plants, from sesame seeds, from beans, from green vegetables, from whole grains, when you get your protein from plants, they're not biologically complete, but they're made biologically complete slowly over hours as those calories enter the bloodstream more slowly because the body can balance the amino acids to make them complete, but it happens little by little over time. It doesn't happen all at once like when you eat an animal product because you, the bacteria build up in the digestive tract. So the body can break down and absorb some of those bacteria as nourishment. It can use the bacteria as fuel to balance amino acids to make the plant proteins complete. It even digests some of the epithelial cells that line the villi. We eat up some of our own body when we eat food and digest. 
So we're absorbing some of our own body cells and some bacteria cells. To, and, with, and the mix of amino acids in various foods are able to be balanced in the bloodstream so the body can make sufficient building blocks and can make su sufficient IGF-1 for growth and repair, but not excessive amounts. We need some insulin, we need some IGF-1, but when we eat animal products, we get excessive amounts of IGF-1 produced. When we eat plant proteins, we get a more reasonable amount that enables us to age slower. One of the reasons why caloric restriction or fasting or feeding an animal less calories makes them live longer is that it restricts IGF-1 production and lower level of IGF-1 production is associated with much slower aging and a longer lifespan. We can only duplicate those longevity experiments by reducing the animal protein in our diet and reducing the high glycemic carbohydrates in our diet. If we want to accelerate cancer, accelerate aging and promote death, I'll tell you what to do. Eat foods that are high glycemic and have high animal protein and mix them together in the same meal, like pizza or like macaroni and cheese or spaghetti and meatballs or a chicken sandwich or whatever it is Americans eat. It's the most dangerous diet that ever could be designed by the human mind. I always say that diet that Americans eat has been designed by ISIS <laughs> or Al-Qaeda. They wouldn't let me say that on PBS. <laughs> they took it out and they put in my mouth the words, that diet's been designed by Darth Vader. And I said, Darth Vader? That's the stupidest joke I've ever heard in my life. What does Darth Vader have to do with designing? That was like, I was infuriated. So don't blame me for that one on television. It was supposed to be Al-Qaeda. And I don't know who they're protecting, what group of political righteousness that protects Al-Qaeda. I have no idea. Anyway. Episodic high glucose damages the brain and shrinks the brain. That's why you're demented, because you're eating all the sugar. So I said to you, the chicken's like the bagel. OK, tell me why the chicken's like a bagel. I just said it a minute ago. I gave you two reasons why the chicken and the bagel are similar. Somebody please tell me, explain it to me in their own words that, that's clear and correct. Why a piece of chicken is like a bagel. Okay, two people said, because neither one has a significant amount of micronutrients. Okay, that's one reason. What's the other reason? What? Chicken doesn't cause the insulin rush. Yes, yes, because they're both hormonally unfavorable. The bagel gives you too much insulin and the chicken gives you too much IGF-1, which is like insulin. That's correct. You got it. So we can go on, right? Because when you eat these foods, you get this dopamine surge in the brain, and you also build up these toxins, and they utilize, and they build up, you know, they, they build up um, toxic waste matter in the body. So when you're not eating the food, your body can detoxify, and you can feel sick. Because when you stop snorting cocaine, you feel worse when you're trying to get off the cocaine. When you stop smoking cigarettes, you feel bad when you stop the cigarettes. When you stop drinking 10 cups, cups of coffee a day, you, stop, you feel bad when you're off the coffee. You feel worse when you're not putting the toxins in your body. Because when the toxins are coming out of the body, that's when you feel ill. Not when the toxins are putting in. You feel better when you throw the toxins in. You feel worse when your body's trying to repair. Repair causes discomfort. That's why things are addic addictive. Because you don't want to deal with discomfort, so you keep smoking and snorting and eating and drinking, right? Most people are so addicted they can't even sit through a lecture like this without putting something in their mouth. <laughs> so detox, feeling un uncomfortable, means your body is trying to heal itself. You're getting well when you're feeling worse. If you're trying to feel better, you're getting worse. Anything that makes you feel s better is bad for you. Let me say that one more time, because I, I can give you a natural herbal product to make you sleep better, or to wake you up so you're not sleeping, or to make your heart beat slower, or to make your heart beat faster, or to make you urinate more, or to make you urinate less. But here's the thing, is that the, the efficacy of the 
natural substance is proportional to its toxicity. It's only working because it's poisonous. Natural foods and nutrients have no ability to have pharmacologic effects. The toxicity is proportional to its pharmacologic effect. And when you take things that are healthy and have nutrients in them, you don't feel better. You don't get a spurge of energy. It doesn't make you, it doesn't make you Superman or do anything to you. When you have broccoli, you didn't feel stronger. You feel nothing. <laughs> if you're looking for magic, something to give you energy or to do something to you, take away your headaches, then you know it's not healthy for you. You want to live in a manner to avoid the need for medicinal substances, whether natural or pharmacologic. That's when you're in good health. You naturally have all the energy you could possibly have automatically. You don't have to take something to stimulate yourself to give you the energy. You wake up fully energized and excited about life already. And so here's the thing. There are two phases to the digestive cycle. The anabolic phase is while you're eating and digesting the food. The word anabolic means to build. It means you're building things into the body. You're putting things into the body. When you're putting things into the body, you're no longer healing and detoxifying. That's when you're feeling better. If you're not on a healthy diet, you're feeling better when you're eating because it's stopping the de de detox. In the catabolic phase, when you're burning off those calories that you ate, in the catabolic phase is when your digestion has ceased, when you're no longer digesting food anymore. Now you're living off of the stored calories. That's when your liver and your kidney can effectively remo remove toxins. That's when your body can heal. The brain cells can restore their, remove free radicals. That's when your body is fixing itself. The longer you live in the catabolic phase, the longer you live. That means the longer you spend time not eating food, the longer you live. The more you keep putting food into your body all the time, the shorter your lifespan. The longer you live with your body healing, the longer you live. The more you live in the body putting things in and not healing, producing waste products and building, the more the shorter your lifespan. Most Americans think they should be eating all the time, like one giant meal from every waking moment. They, think they wake up in the middle of the night to eat food because they feel so bad after they in the middle of the night. They don't eat, they can't sleep, or they, they're feeling ill in the middle of the night from all their toxins in their body. When you're eating a diet that's rich in nutrients and you didn't bathe your body with all these poisons, you don't feel ill in the catabolic phase. You feel nothing. People feel shaky and weak and headachy in the catabolic phase, forcing them to overeat calories to stop the detox process. People on an American diet are forced to keep eating all the time, otherwise they feel so fatigued, and they think their fatigue is hunger. Fatigue is not hunger. Fatigue doesn't come from not lack of calories. It comes from detoxification from bad diet. Then you eat more food to get rid of the fatigue. So these symptoms of headache and weakness and stomach cramps and headaches and shakiness and anxiety and fatigue are not hunger. They're detoxification symptoms from eating poorly. And if you feel them, you're not healthy. So most Americans go on this diet where their, their glucose pipes up. They're eating, digesting their food in the anabolic phase. And then when they finish digesting food, when the glucose goes down, in, the, in that straight line in the middle called the catabolic phase, now you're living off of glycogen because the brain needs glucose to function. And now you're surviving when you're not eating and not digesting, you're surviving on the glycogen that's been stored in the body and the liver and the muscle tissues. But most Americans don't get to live off that stored glycogen because they start, the minute they enter the catabolic phase, the minute digestion stops, they start to feel ill and they feel better if they eat again. So they eat again. Or they eat such a big meal with so many hard to digest calories, they're overeating on cheese and meats and they eat such a big meal, they keep digestion going all day practically until they get to the next meal. They gotta keep the body in the anabolic phase all day long. When you're eating a healthy diet, you enter the catabolic phase and you feel nothing until the glycogen stores are almost gone and then true hunger kicks in to prevent you from losing any muscle mass, and that kicks in as a mild sensation in your neck and your mouth and your throat. It's not weakness, it's not fatigue, it's not shakiness, and it's not, that, it's not that uncomfortable. And many times I'll eat, purposely eat a light dinner or just have a glass of vegetable juice at dinner and go to bed a little hungry. Because one tool to extend lifespan is enhancing the catabolic phase at night. Matter of fact, a recent study 
had women with breast cancer followed for 10 years, and those that had a 13-hour window between the end of finishing dinner to the start of breakfast the next morning decreased their risk of breast cancer recurrence by about 30%. They didn't improve their diet. They needed less calories. They needed better calories. They just had a bigger window at night of not eating. They just ate an earlier dinner. They lived longer and they had less cancer. A longevity technique is to now narrow your anabolic window, expanding your catabolic window. Eating like a later breakfast than an earlier dinner, so you have more hours of no food, especially going to bed on an empty stomach, or sometimes I purposely go to bed a little bit hungry. Two nights a week, I'll purposely like eat a very light dinner because I want to go to bed a little bit hungry as a longevity-enhancing technique. So this toxic hunger leads people to eat, go from one anabolic phase to another anabolic phase to another anabolic phase. They never stop. The body is never stops working, dealing with having to deal with foodstuffs and metabolic waste products that, that form in the body from the result of eating and eating and overeating. You have to eat healthfully to feel comfortable in the catabolic phase. The reason people fail on diets because they don't feel comfortable not eating. It's too uncomfortable not to eat all the time. They can't sustain a diet because they're not comfortable. It's impossible to sustain a diet unless you focus on the quality of what you eat so you can be totally comfortable in the catabolic phase. Do you understand that? Everybody here understands that? Now, fast food kills more people than smoking. When you live in an inner city in a food desert, you have 10 times the risk of heart attack. You have seven times the risk of strokes before age 45. One of the biggest growing businesses in America, if you want to make some money and a killing, is opening up a nursing home to take care of people who've had strokes between the ages of 25 and 55 years old. Because you can't get into the nursing homes that take 60-year-old people and beyond. They have to make special nursing homes for these young people get having strokes nowadays. So we're talking here that my new book, Fast Food Genocide, is called genocide because we have a ubiquitous problem across America where everybody is dying and ruining their brains and killing themselves with, from food consumption. But in the inner cities, in these food deserts, it's really horrible things are happening where people are having diabetes and leg amputations and going blind and having strokes at young ages. And you have an explosion of autism, learning disability, lack of ability to achieve the American dream, and succeed with prosperity and education, all because food access is destroying people's brains and intellectual opportunity and increasing crime and mental illness and violence. Fast food and junk food and candy destroys the brain. It doesn't just destroy your liver and your kidney and your circulation and your heart. Your brain is very vulnerable to these foods. The link between candy and crime and drug abuse is better than the link between poverty and drug use and lack of parents or bad parenting and drug use or crime. It's the primary cause of depression and violence and anger and crime. And it's the gateway drug to more serious drug use. And half the people incarcerated in federal prisons today are there because of nonviolent drug-related offenses. Our whole prison population is populated with millions and millions of people who are there because of this fast food-oriented food you know, env food environment we have in America. And how many people here in this audience right now are women who are not pregnant and never had a baby? Raise your hand if you're not pregnant and never had a baby. Okay, a lot of people. So here's what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you the food you eat right now, even though you've never had a baby, is going to affect the health of your offspring whenever you do have a baby, or if you ever have a baby. You're, that health of that baby, the intelligence of that baby, whether they have learning disabilities, attention disorder, autism, mental retardation, childhood cancers, autoimmune conditions, or brain tumors, are linked to the diet you eat before you get even conceive the baby. Did you follow that? It's called, we're destroying future generations. And the studies show that your bad diet doesn't just destroy the first generation. It, it, it weakens the health of multiple generations. 
we're weakening the genes that we're leaving on to our grandchildren by the diet you're eating. And that that's also for you males in the audience who may be conceiving a child in the, next, in the future. Your diet, too, is affecting the health of your offspring. Did you follow that? For you women who are, not, who are going to give birth at some point in the future, those eggs that are living in your body have been there your whole life. The eggs that are forming your children have been there since you were formed in your mother's womb at your birth, and before you were born. Those eggs and those cells live with you your whole life, and you damage those cells when you eat damaging food. You have a responsibility to take care of your future offspring, of future generations that are living in your body when you go and eat candy at Halloween when you're nine years old. You're destroying your children then. And your parents are your enablers. It's amazing, isn't it? So we're taught in medical school, right, that these urban populations have double the risk of heart attack and 80% higher risk of stroke and, you know, increased risk of dementia and four times likely to have kidney failure. All this stuff we learn is based on bigotry and falsity. Because when we really look at the data, it's not that this color of your skin had anything to do with this stuff. It's not about race. We look at Caucasian populations who are, don't have access to good food, who are in areas of the country in the South, who are eating poorly. You see the same high rates of disease and violence and crime and depression. Did you follow what I'm saying? Genetic color of your skin has very little to do with it. It's what we're putting in our bodies. It's what food's in the environment around the people that they taught to eat. It's all about educating people about what to eat and, the, and having equal access to put the proper food to eat. The whole point here is we've got to work together to really give people equal opportunity, and it has to start with taking care of your own health first, and then, as, and, and then reaching out to help other people. This should be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional science taught in school, because the one most critical thing that affects your destiny, your life, your intelligence, your prosperity, your happiness, most all the good things you deserve in life is dependent on the quality of food you put into your body. It's as simple as that. And if you don't do that, if you don't put in good quality into food into your body, then you're insane. Or you become insane. One of the two. Look at this. Scientists examining the impact of food deserts, areas where there's mostly convenience stores and no produce availability in areas of Chicago. So that those overweight individuals in those areas who develop diabetes in the food deserts lose 45 years of potential life is lost. Isn't that amazing? They're losing more than half their life because of food. Yet I'm saying that these individuals with obesity and diabetes would have been able to live to be 100 years old if they ate right. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing genetically inferior about them. When black Americans were freed after the Civil War, there were more centenarians and more long-lived people among the black population than there was among the white population. They were achieving educational achievements and, and, and moving up in their, the economic ladder. And then, of course, we had Pellegra, which was high in the South, which caused rednecks and violent attitudes, which precipitated and exacerbated violence against blacks. And of course, their success made a lot of violence in the Jim Crow laws and other. The eugenic movement is a big story, a big part of human history. But the point I'm making now is what we're learning today by medical authorities and into the institutions of learning that people with different skin tone are more likely to be sick is, imp is not true. It's the, it's the diet is the, prob the problem, not your genetics or your race. Matter of fact, so what I'm saying right now is that we have a unique opportunity to ha enable people to succeed and, and enable people to be better, to be, have better intellectual achievement, to do better in their children, to all these um, to all these emotional, psychologically, and intellectual benefits based on feeding children properly, right? So we're talking here about um, this disease called pellagra, which occurred from niacin deficiency. 
in the South, in the South today, we have still have higher areas where they eat more fried food, more processed foods, more heart attacks, more strokes. And of course, sugar and fried foods increase your risk of stroke tremendously. So the big call to stroke belt. But in the olden days, we had more people eating this diet with lots of corn and pork and molasses and sugar in the old South causing rednecks, because you got this red rash around the neck, so the original term rednecks, and it caused people to become homicidal, suicidal, and violent. We're still doing this today. We're still not learning from our mistakes. That when you eat poorly, when you're nutritionally deficient, when you're eating junk food with no nutrients in it, it causes people to become more angry, more violent, more prone to drug use and criminal behavior, right? So it was a backlash against the rise of the black middle class in the 1860s and 70s. And then we had this eugenic movement, which discussed that how of racial superiority that started here in this country, that then Hitler then adopted and took to Europe and started the Nazi thing, and, and we started world... So all this thing really came from... The, the originated from the whites in, the, in southern America. Did you follow that? What the Nazis picked up on. During the Nuremberg trials, Nazis were defending themselves by pulling these textbooks made, written by Americans that, were, that talked about the superiority of the, of the Aryan race that started in this country. So the brain's under attack. We're talking here about lower intellectual performance, lower IQ, autism, and the fact that parents are bringing donuts to soccer games, taking their kids on, at birthday parties. Who has the courage? You know, we're such... We have such low self-esteem that we can't stand up for what's right if we're afraid the way people are going to think of us in some way that isn't favorable. You'd rather have a birthday party and serve other kids poison. You'd rather bring your donut to the soccer game so you look like the other mothers look. You don't want to stand up for what's right and serve banana ice cream made with frozen bananas and macadamia nuts with some fresh banana bean powder for the birthday party with a birthday cake or made from pineapple and and, um, you know, zucchini and carrots, a delicious, you know, chocolate cake. In other words, you can make incredibly delicious gourmet food. Every eating occasion, every public eating occasion, every, every social occasion, every party, every birthday party is an opportunity to be courageous, to stand up for something. It's only, we're only going to save America. We're only going to save our health care crisis. We're only going to stop the crime and the tragedy and the leg amputation and the blindness and the needless deaths and the diabetic epidemic, and all these people getting ruined and destroyed, is if every person stands up as an example, takes good care of their own health, and doesn't permit other people to eat unhealthfully, and doesn't, and doesn't enable people to eat unhealthily because they want to be like everybody else. Every public eating occasion is an opportunity to express your superpower to affect people positively, be a role model, and possibly have a better effect on somebody else. Maybe it won't work. You don't give up. Maybe it'll take 10 tries for one person to be helped. Doesn't matter. That's what life's about. It's all about trying to help those people, not giving up and trying to help people who need help. And the minute you go along with that, and the minute you're an enabler, just because you, have low, just because you want to fit along, fit in, and do what other people do, then you're doing something that's not right. You're doing something that's really wrong. You can enable evil by wanting to fit along, to, to get along. Look what happened years ago through human history. All these people just went along with evil, right? Because they didn't want to be attacked in some way. We talked about this, that no other variable, not poverty, bad parenting, has the effect on crime and drug abuse compared to eating sweets and candy and fast food. You know, if you're eating fast food and you're still taking in burgers and fries and candy and those foods, then you're either insane right now or you're going to be insane soon. But addictions don't want to die. And change is anxiety provoking. It takes some time. For this, it's, there's some discomfort when you start doing this. There's emotional discomfort because you're giving up that addiction. But you have to do it today. No more excuses. 
Don't tell, it's not your stress in your life. You can handle your stress of medical school better if you're eating right. You can handle the stress of your problems with your job if you're eating right. You have better brain function. You think more clearly. You remember things more. You're more creative. Get rid of the, you solve your stress problems better right now. If you eat right, right now, and you drop that excess weight, start dropping at least two pounds a week, don't stop giving yourself excuses. Now's the time to do the right thing. Enough is enough. How many people here are going to join me with this idea that we've got to set an example, we've got to be in great health, don't stop babying yourself and giving up, get back in the game, I don't care if you checked out, given up, had trouble, do it right, and you'll see you can do it, you have a great supportive system here in Detroit, in this area of the country, you can have food, you can have meetups and dinner parties, and you can have other people supporting you, there's no longer reason to commit suicide with food, we know too much today, we have to work together, because emotional eating makes your emotions worse, right? That's, that's a joke. That means that he's now addicted to donuts, and so heroin was his gateway drug to donuts and sugar. You know, you get the joke? <laughs> heroin was his gateway drug. So look, salt is also addicting, too. And salt causes strokes. There are two types of strokes. There's the embolic stroke, which is caused by heart attacks. Uh, excuse me, there's embolic strokes that has the same cause as heart attacks caused by a clot. And there's the hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleed. What I'm saying right now is that being on a plant-based or plant-rich or vegan or flexitarian diet, a diet with, little bit of, with low in animal products or no animal products, does not protect you against hemorrhagic stroke. It could even make you more likely to have a hemorrhagic stroke if you're still eating a lot of salt. Because higher cholesterol levels are associated with embolic stroke of clots, but higher cholesterol levels are associated with protection from hemorrhagic stroke. Because the fat and the, the plaque on the inner wall of the blood vessels thicken the fragile blood vessels in the brain, making them less likely to break apart due to hemorrhage. What I'm saying to you right now is that excessive salt causes microvascular hemorrhaging. It slowly eats away and damages the inner wall of your blood vessels, increasing your risk of hemorrhagic stroke, even if you don't have high blood pressure. It doesn't just cause high blood pressure. It weakens the interior wall of your blood vessels. Why am I telling you this? Because we don't, like in a lot of Asian countries, people don't have as many embolic strokes, but they have five times a higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. They eat less meat and less bacon and less cheeseburgers, but they eat more salt and they have more hemorrhagic stroke. It's even more important to watch your salt intake the more you're on a plant-based diet. We don't want you to switch from one side of the cause of stroke to the other. And the same thing, oils, the more oil you have in your life, if you come on a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, if you're using oil, you're flooding your body with omega-6 fats, increasing your risk of depression, increasing your risk of inflammation, and even cancer from the high use of oils. Those are processed foods. Here's a study that was a meta-analysis which encompassed more than 44,000 deaths, showing that as people ate nuts and seeds as their source of fat, instead of oil, the risk of cardiovascular death went down by almost 40%. This is irrefutable evidence. It's, these are long-term studies going on for decades with many thousands of people with hard endpoints. A hard endpoint means death. We look at hard endpoint studies. I can show you any study that can prove almost anything you want it to prove, that eggs are okay for you by comparing eggs to something worse or by having a diet already rich, have so much animal products and cholesterol in it that the eggs don't even make a difference. But if we really want to see if something's healthy or not, we have to do a long-term study that goes on for decades and looks at hard endpoints. And we know that diets low in nuts and seeds or low in fat increase the risk of both cardiovascular death and cancer death, and they shorten lifespan. Even the Seventh-day Adventist study done on vegans and near-vegans so that those vegans eating a diet without nuts and seeds or less nuts and seeds had a shorter lifespan than vegans who ate nuts and seeds. And it even showed that flexitarians eating some meat who ate nuts and seeds lived longer than the vegans who didn't eat nuts and seeds. Did you follow that? Yeah. <laughs> and here's the PrevaMed study. 
which compared olive oil to nuts and seeds. First, they did a study, and they showed that when people ate less butter and more olive oil, heart attack rates went down by 15%, proving olive oil is a health food because heart attack rates went down by 15% when people ate more olive oil and less butter. That doesn't prove anything. Just because it's better than butter doesn't mean it's good. You don't buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. But here's the point. When people then switched from olive oil to butter, then heart attack rates went down by another 60%. When they moved from more nuts to fewer nuts to more nuts, that's when the really heart attacks disappeared. The fat from nuts and seeds has special biological properties to prevent inflammation, to facilitate the absorption of anti-cancer phytochemicals. You can absorb 10 times the anti-cancer phytochemicals when your meal has a little bit of fat from nuts and seeds in it compared to one that was just low in fat. You're not getting the anti-cancer benefit from that meal if, it's very, if the whole meal is low in fat. And the very low fat meal also, and the very low fat can create irregular heartbeats as well, especially when you're getting a, a bad exposure to DHA or omega-3 fatty acids, especially if there's omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. Let me say this one more time, that in vegans, and in people on near-vegan diets, they can be at increased risk of developing depression and dementia in later life because of omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. And it's very critical not to make those mistakes because in, in some meta-analysis com combination studies, it showed that long-term vegans have more depression than non-vegans. Now, of course, plant foods prevent depression and processed foods cause depression. It's not the only cause of depression. Whether vegans have more depression or, or, or less depression is almost irrelevant because nobody should have depression. We shouldn't have a high exposure to get depression in either group. But the cause of depression in a vegan population is very often the lack of omega-3 fatty acids like EPA and DHA because some people don't produce enough EPA, especially DHA, from the short-chain fatty acids in their diet. We did a study on 166 vegans who were not supplementing, and over two-thirds of them were shown to be DHA deficient. And those that were not DHA deficient were not the ones eating a lot of walnuts and flax seeds and restricting oils. It really was based on differences in genetic conversion enzyme. It was so some were deficient and some were not based on genetic difference in genetics, not based on what their diet was like. So we, don't, we want people to be careful. If you're going to live to be 100 years old, we want your full mental faculties intact, and that means you have to make sure you take adequate B12 and adequate DHA on a vegan diet, or at least check your levels that are adequate if you're not taking it. Now, I have this acronym on the board, GBOMS, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, because the reason I want it's so important to memorize that acronym is because these are the foods that show the most powerful protection against cancer. For example, take any one of these foods individually, like flax seeds or chia seeds with their lignans. Studies show that women who have breast cancer, who eat a little bit of lignans every day, reduce their risk of recurrence of breast cancer by 71%. Their lifespan increased. They didn't die of cancer. Same thing, when people add onions in their diet, especially raw onions, they showed between a 55 and 88% reduction in cancer. Studies on, on mushrooms show that women who ate one mushroom a day had a 64% low risk of breast cancer. What if we put together a diet style with a full portfolio of all these foods that have been shown in scientific studies to prevent cancer individually? What if we do a diet that includes all these foods together? then we can really wipe out cancer. And we're even showing that people with early stage breast cancer and early stage prostate cancer is reversible, just like heart disease is. When people eat a diet, and I'm doing a, we're doing a study right now at Northern Arizona University where we're recruiting thousands of women. It's called the Nutritarian Women's Health Study. We're in the process, we've already recruited more than 2,000 women already part of the study. We want to get 10,000 women in the study. We're looking to recruit more women to join the study. And all you have to do to join the study is go to nutritionalresearch.org, nutritionalresearch.org, and click on the tag for the Nutritarian Women's Health Study and read the information about how to join. You get written information. You will join in forums and groups. You're instructed on getting instructions on how to eat 
G-bombs, if you're eating G-bombs every day and trying to encourage you to eat better health, and we're tracking these women over decades to show that we can protect against breast cancer, and we're even encouraging lots of women who have breast cancer, especially early stage breast cancers, to join the study and to show that they can survive and, re and re prevent or, or prevent recurrence or recover from cancer. So we're look, taking all adult women, whether they're healthy or not healthy, as long as they're pledging to follow a nutritarian diet that includes these G-bombs. And we talked about, remember we talked about the resistant starch in beans and, the, and their slowly digestible starches and they fuel the microbiome, that one of the most important things we've learned in the last 10 years about human nutrition is how, these, how beans have such protective properties to prolong lifespan due to their content of slowly digestible starches that don't require much insulin, and their high levels of resistant starch, including split peas of high levels of resistant starch that fuel the growth of protective microbiome. Now, brown rice is no longer a food recommended by myself for people because, of its, because it's contaminated with arsenic. White rice is too high glycemic, and brown rice is too contaminated with arsenic because the shell of the rice, the, the, the hull that makes it brown, picks up arsenic like a sponge. I do eat some rice, but I buy it from a special company, more expensive rice that's grown on wild marshes in Canada and Minnesota that are knocked down from canoes, into, into, knocked down with, with wooden sticks into canoes that's really grown very wild. It's the commercially raised rices that have the, have the arsenic in them. And the Consumer Reports did a whole report on the arsenic content of rice. And besides the rice being contaminated, the animal products are contaminated, the chickens are contaminated, the eggs are contaminated. They're contaminated with flame retardant chemicals that cause cancer as well, that cause thyroid disease. Because the chickens have the flame retardant chemicals in their bedding. And they peck at them and they eat them. And, and the flame retardant chemicals are in the eggs. And they feed the chickens arsenic to prevent worms and bacteria and then the arsenic in their um, poop, they use as fertilizer. So they're fertilizing the, the vegetables and the rice with arsenic-containing chicken poop. You only want to eat rice that's fertilized with wild duck poop, not chicken poop. <laughs> so look, to come to a close here before I show you some we're going to fly through some, some patient success. But before we do that, we just want to make this clear that we are not discussing issues that are controversial here. This is acceptable by the broad majority of nutritional scientists around the world. That fruits and vegetables and nuts and beans and whole intact grains are good for you. When you grind the grain into flour and you make it into pasta or, or bread, it's maybe too high glycemic, and I'm not saying that's good for you, but the intact grain, like the teft or the wheat berry or the, or the intact quinoa or the millet or the, or the, you know, the amaranth, whatever it is, the intact grain cooked with water, those are relatively low glycemic. The point I'm making is vegetables, beans, seeds, nuts, fruit are good for us. Excessive amounts of animal products Everybody recognizes those excessive amounts of animal products today cause disease, but the general public doesn't accept what the preponderance of evidence in the nutritional literature shows because there's so much messaging out there that's just lying to people and tricking them and scamming them. And of course, refined carbohydrates, candy and white rice and white bread and white sugar and pasta and bagels and bread is dangerous food. It doesn't just cause obesity. It also causes cancer and dementia and hemorrhagic strokes. White foods are dangerous. Can't, don't trust anything that's too white. <laughs> Cocaine, cigarettes, right? What's all that other stuff they people snort and snuff and inject and everything? I don't know what I'm up to. Anyway. Here we're talking about, I want to make something clear so you really understand that nobody's taking a risk. I, I strongly object to the irresponsible vegan message that people don't have to worry about fatty acids. That's not true. 
A vegan diet has the potential to accelerate the risk of, de of dementia and depression if you're fatty acid deficient. That means that you have to, so here's, we show that brain shrinkage occurs when people have omega-3 index below four. 3.5, you already had a, uh, you know, a shrinking parts of the brain leading to decreased memory and dementia later in life. In other words, when your omega-3 index is low, you're at increased risk of dementia. And if you're not going to get cancer and heart disease and strokes, you're going to live a long time, you might as well keep your mental faculties intact by making sure you're not DHA deficient on a vegan diet. I'm not saying everybody is low in DHA in a vegan diet. About a third of people are not. But it's irresponsible to tell people they don't have to worry about anything on a vegan diet. They do have to be concerned about this and to make sure that they don't become DHA deficient. Now, they make DHA from algae, and you don't have to eat fish to get it. And if you don't want to take the supplement, then you don't have to take a supplement, but at least check your blood to make sure you're not deficient then. Don't just bury your head in the sand because your nutritional guru told you you didn't have to worry about it. There's too, many, too much irresponsible and incorrect information going out there in the vegan community that's playing Russian roulette with people's lives. That's irresponsible and egotistical because people don't want to admit that they're wrong or don't want to change their viewpoints when more science becomes available. And that's how we get these diets going on for years and years, telling people not to eat any fat in their diet, for example. So we don't want people to shrink their brain, right? The recent research showed that 64% were insufficient. And a nutritarian diet is vegetable-based, not grain-based. And most of you, and there's no reason why you have to avoid nuts and seeds, whether you have heart disease or not. You have to avoid excess calories. It doesn't matter. You don't have to, it's not that nut calories are more, fat calories are more dangerous if they come from a whole food. But you do have to get rid of your body fat. You do have to eat the right amount of food and not overeat on fattening food or overeat on nuts and seeds. You have to eat when you're hungry and not eat when you're not hungry. You have to eat healthy foods and eat reasonable portions of food and not recreationally eat all day long. And you can't be healthy if you're overweight. To be healthy, your BMI has to be below 23. Any significant fat storage in the body puts you at high risk. All oils are dangerous. They're, of course, more dangerous when they're cooked but oil, oil, oil is dangerous. And your diet has to be focused on nutrient-dense foods, and you have to eat a salad every day, and you have to eat your G-bombs. And part of the fun is learning these delicious tasting recipes and improving your taste and your smell so you enjoy eating more, not less. And animal products has to be limited or eliminated to very small amounts, or not at all. And nutritional excellence powerfully protects against disease. And if you have a disease, get rid of it. If you're sick with a chronic illness, don't be satisfied that you're going to have it the rest of your life. Get rid of it. And you can do it. I'm going to skip this. I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip this how animal protein shortens lifespan for multiple generations. And we show this with animals that are carnivores. If they eat more animal protein, it prevents the prey animal from being decimated by shortening the lifespan of the, pre of the predator animal, and it shortens the lifespan of multiple generations so the prey can recuperate and, and repopulate their population. I know this idea of building growth and making it bigger with animal protein is one of the biggest fallacies in nutrition, almost as bad as this idea that olive oil is health food, right? All this ridiculous information we think we're learning, because high-protein diets, and cause death. Here's a study on 6,000 people followed for 18 years, showing a fourfold increase in cancer death and a 75% increase in total death rate from people eating more animal products compared to people eating less, or less than 10% of calories from animal products. Here's a study on 443 vegans, excuse me, on 443 nutritarians whose blood pressure dropped 26 points in the sixth month on the diet, showing more permanent weight loss than any study because people, the average person lost 50 pounds and kept it off as they continued to lose more weight as the, year, the future years that progressed. Followed for multiple years, continuing to lose more weight, dropping weight, because you don't just live longer, because you're 
you're living with full mental faculty and full physical capacity, so you have a, a, a longer life, but a much longer healthy life expectancy. Like all these people, here's a person who had diabetic faced with a leg amputation, crying to his doctor, said to his doctor, I'll do anything, anything not to have my leg cut off. Just tell me what to do. Doctor didn't know what to tell him to do. He said, go see this guy, Steve, a doctor down below. He's into some of this like nutritarian diet. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that'll help you. So the guy got rid of his diabetes. He saved his leg, right? He saved the amputation. The circulation came back. The infection went away. Here's Emily who lost 100 pounds, relieved her asthma, her allergies, her depression, her major depression lifted. The fog lifts. Here's Scott who lost 300 pounds. He actually is lighter than that now, right? He got rid of, of course, all his sleep apnea, his high blood pressure, his 10 medications he was taking. Here's Teresa, which also had heart disease and high cholesterol. Her LDL dropped from 148 to 92, got rid of her heart disease, her high blood pressure, her pre-diabetic syndrome. Here's Bill, a food addict. Lost 100 pounds, lost off his medications for heart disease, blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. Here's Steve, who lost Steve and, Sa and Tara. The 226 is what she weighed, the 447 is what he weighed. One year later, she lost 80 pounds the first year. He lost 220 pounds that first year. 220 pounds in one year he lost. It's not a typo, that's real. Their daughter, Chloe, lost 32 pounds, got rid of her asthma. Got rid of his sleep apnea, his diabetes, his heart disease went away, his chest pains went away. And you know what really thrilled about this? Really thrilled? You guys know, I said it the same joke last year. The dog! <laughs> He's finally got room to sit in the car. <laughs> See him over there? Look, the power to change, the power to transform America is in our grasp. You've got a huge opportunity here in this area of the country with so many thousands of people embracing healthy eating and plant-based eating. This can be, you guys can work together to take this even further, right? To be a, an explosion of good health, an explosion of positivity. Setting up, get recognized for what you're doing here. Every person here who's not in perfect health, I want to see you next year 60 to 80 pounds less, right? I want to see you off your medications and back. I want to see you all living examples of phenomenal health. That's how we're going to change America, by changing ourselves. We need teachers and we need truck drivers and postmen and librarians and athletes and media people and educators, and we need everybody. And they're not going to come from the government. It's not going to come from the politicians that are affected by lobbyists and, and the dollars of who their constituency is and who's paying their salaries. And it's not going to come from, it has to come from the people. It has to come from you guys. And it has to come from people who take great care of their health. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And we have to bring healthy eating to people who are more vulnerable. We have to transform America's inner cities into zones of nutritional excellence. This can only happen with us all working together. And I get a lot of satisfaction and personal reward from being able to help, and I've changed the lives of millions of people. It's unbelievable. But you get the same satisfaction from helping 10 people. It's not about the number. The whole point is, it's better than winning the Olympics. What I'm saying for you guys, is to get that feeling of satisfaction from taking care of your own health and being able to articulate the ability to help other people and improve their nutrition too. And you can only do it if you're a great example. You can't do it if you don't walk the walk. Keep your mouth shut unless you walk the walk, unless you're doing it yourself. You can't tell a person, a doctor who's smoking cigarettes isn't going to convince another person to quit. A doctor who's significantly overweight isn't going to convince another person to be in great shape, right? You've got to be in great shape yourself to convince other people. So a lot of you already purchased Fast Food Genocide. I've written 12 books. This book took me a long time to prepare, about four years, one of the most difficult books, and I really think it's very fascinating. 
I gave you a little touch of that information tonight, but I think that I feel very strongly and very passionate that with this information becoming more known, we can really have an impact on saving human lives and decreasing the tr all the tragedies we see around you. So just to, before I go, I want to ask you a question. How many people have had somebody that they know in their family member or their, or their loved ones been stabbed with a knife? Raise your hand, stabbed with a knife, raise your hand. Okay, three or four people. How many people shot with a gun? Somebody in their family or their loved ones or their extended family that's been shot with a bullet and either killed or maimed or damaged with a bullet? Raise your hand. Oh, a couple of people, like two people. Okay, that's good to know, good to know. All right, now how many people here have a loved one who either has, has had diabetes or heart disease or a stroke or cancer? Raise your hand. Oh, shit, shoot. <laughs> we got to get out of that neighborhood. Here's the point. That's a dangerous neighborhood to live in. You got to get out of that neighborhood right away. Get someplace safe immediately. Right? You guys get this? How can we live in that neighborhood anymore? How can you tolerate that? How can you see so many sick people around you anymore? How do you stand for it? How do you keep your mouth shut with this going around you? you that's, so you guys have to develop the expertise. We need your brains and your voices and your intellect and your mouth to spread this message. All right, I'm done. Thank you.